Thank you so much for coming. My name is John Friedman. I'm the chair of the Economics Department. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event uh, and uh, tell you a little, a little bit about what we're going to do and uh, introduce Oded. So uh, we're here today to, to learn about and discuss uh, Oded's new book, uh, The Journey of Humanity. And we're going to divide the event today into three different uh, roughly even sections. We're going to start with a presentation from Oded to uh, tell us about some of the key ideas in the book. We're then going to have a conversation between Oded and uh, two of uh, our colleagues on the faculty, Mark Blythe and, and Glenn Lowry. And then finally, we'll end with some time for questions from the audience. Uh, but let me now turn to introducing Oded, who's going to uh, kick us off. So Oded is the Herbert H. Goldberger Professor of Economics at Brown. And uh, for the last uh, nearly 40 years at Brown, since he came here following his PhD at Columbia, uh, he's uh, founded and developed the idea of unified growth theory, which is a way to really integrate and understand the fundamental causes of development, prosperity, and inequality, not just looking over the past 10 or even the previous 50 years, but really thinking over the entire span of human history. And I think when you come at the problem from this way, uh, the broader perspective really highlights the role of many deep-rooted factors in the transition from stagnation to growth, uh, which has resulted in really unprecedented kind of material prosperity and health, but at the same time, the emergence of immense inequality, both within nations and especially across the globe. So Oded's work uh, in this area has been incredibly influential uh, over the course of his career. You know, he's published just innumerable articles. His work is cited more than 33,000 times. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Economic Growth, which is a journal that he founded and continues to run today, as well as co-director of the NBER Research Group on Income Distributions and Macroeconomics. He was recently awarded honorary degrees at the Catholic University of Louvain, as well as Poznan University in Poland. He's an elected fellow of the Econometric Society, a Sackler Fellow of Tel Aviv. You know, I could go on, but if I listed all of his many distinguished positions, right, we never actually have time for Oded to talk. And so today, we're here to learn and discuss about his new book, uh, where he's distilled, really, insights from a lifetime of work into um, this narrative. Uh, we have the fortune of having him today here on the day of the release. The book is being released in 28 languages across the world, which I think uh, is incredible to allow such a broad audience in order to benefit from, from Oded's insights. And so uh, without further ado, let me welcome Oded Galore to the podium. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to introduce you to uh, the scope of this book. So the journey of humanity is an attempt to explore the evolution of human societies since the emergence of an atomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. In fact, it's an attempt to decipher two of the most fundamental mysteries that surround the journey of humanity. The first one can be defined as the mystery of growth, namely, what are the roots of the dramatic transformation in living standards in the past two centuries after hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation? And the second one can be defined as the mystery of inequality, namely, what are the origins of the inequality in the wealth of nations? Now, over most of human existence, human life was largely nasty, brutish, and short. In fact, it was remarkably similar to that of any other species on planet Earth. Humans were preoccupied by survival and reproduction. Living standards were very close to the subsistence level. And there were minor differences in living conditions across time and across space. In fact, only a few centuries ago, one-fourth of newborn did not reach their first birthday, and half of newborn did not reach their reproductive life. Numerous women perish during childbirth. Life expectancy fluctuated in a narrow range of 25 to 40, and rarely exceeded 40. And most people had not departed from their remote birthplaces, were illiterate, 
and to a large extent lived in the darkness after the disappearance of the sun over the horizon. But perhaps most remarkably, this is a time period in which economic crisis is not leading into belt tightening. In fact, it results in mass starvation and extinction. Now, in the past two centuries, in contrast, the world is experiencing this dramatic metamorphosis, an incredible spike in living standards across the globe. Income per capita in the world as a whole is increasing by a factor of 14, and in some regions of the world by a factor of 50 or 100. Life expectancy has more than doubled, and a great divergence emerged in per capita income across countries and regions of the world. Now, to illustrate this dramatic transformation, consider for a moment residents of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago. And suppose that we whisk these individuals in a time machine into Jerusalem during the Ottoman period in the 19th century. Despite this 2,000-year jump, these individuals will be able to adapt instantaneously to the environment that exists in Ottoman Jerusalem. Past knowledge would be largely applicable, Technological improvements would be merely incremental. Occupations would require very similar skills. And life expectancy would remain largely unchanged. And as a result of it, would not require any adaptation in the context of the mindsets of individuals. But then, consider these individuals again and whisk them only 200 years more forward from Ottoman Jerusalem in the 19th century to Jerusalem of today. Despite this short 200 years jump in the context of this time period, this will be a shocking experience, a devastating experience. In fact, past knowledge would be largely obsolete. Modern technologies would appear as a witchcraft Occupations would require incomprehensible skills, and life expectancy would double, and as a result of it would require reorientation of individuals' mindset, future-oriented mindset, education decisions, saving decisions, life cycle decisions. So in fact, in contrast to the conventional wisdom, light living standards, over human existence hardly change, and we will not see a gradual improvement in living standards in the course of human history. Technological progress accelerated over time, but nevertheless, it had negligible impact on living standard, simply contributed to population growth. And in fact, the rise in living standards in the past two centuries reflect what I will define as a phase transition, namely an abrupt transformation once a tipping point has been reached. Now to visualize this dramatic transformation, consider the evolution of income per capita in the past 2,000 years. And as you can see in front of you, living standards were near subsistence over most of human history over hundreds of thousands of years. And then, suddenly, 200 years ago, we see this dramatic spike in income per capita across the globe, a dramatic increase in income per capita across the globe. In fact, if I'd remove the labels from, this, uh, from the axis of this figure, most people would imagine that what we see in front of us is, in fact, the output of a seismograph that detects tectonic activities a major eruption that appears out of the blue. But in fact, this is how income per capita evolved in the course of human history. Now, at the same time, societies across the globe are not departing at the same time period. Some societies are taking off around the beginning of the 19th century, others only recently, and consequently, since this takeoff is associated with a 14-fold increase in income per capita, a huge divergence is emerging in the world economy. 
Naturally, the resolution of these two mysteries, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality, would require, therefore, a better identification of the forces that permitted the transition from stagnation to growth, the forces that led to the differential timing of the transition across societies, and the role of historical and even prehistorical forces in this process. And naturally, the resolution of these mysteries would provide us with insights that would permit us to design strategies that could mitigate inequality across the globe. Now, given the framework that I just constructed, it is apparent that in order to understand the vast inequality across the globe today, we must step backward in human time and to understand the evolution of societies in the course of human history, to resolve the mystery of growth, and then to try to address the mystery of inequality. So when you consider the phases of development in the course of human history, one can identify three fundamental phases. The Malthusian epoch, the post-Malthusian regime, and the modern growth regime. The Malthusian epoch originates with the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago, and it spans 99.9% .9 of human existence, ending in the eve of industrialization around 1750 in the most advanced societies in the world. Now, what is unique about this Malthusian epoch is that it, characterizes, it char is characterized by interesting dualism. On the one hand, stagnation in living standards, but on the other hand, certain dynamism in technology, in the population, and in the adaptation of the population to the technological environment. And it is this dynamism that ultimately permits the world to take off initially into the post-Maltusian regime, and ultimately in the aftermath of the demographic transition into the modern growth regime. So when we think about the Malthusian epoch, we shouldn't consider the epoch as a period of stagnation. We should consider the dualism that is characterizing this era. Stagnation on the one hand, and dynamism on the other hand. So we see stagnation in living standards. Income per capita fluctuates in a very narrow band around subsistence. And life expectancy fluctuates in a narrow band of 25 to 40 for a prolonged period of time. But as I said, there is great dynamism. Dynamism in the context of technological progress, dynamism in the context of population growth, dynamism in the context of adaptation. At any point in time, these processes are very slow, but over 300,000 year period, they generate an enormous impact, and in fact, they trigger the transition from stagnation to growth. So given the importance of these forces for the understanding of the inequality across the globe as we see it today, it is important to understand the three fundamental links that are operating in the Malthusian epoch. First, the impact of technology or technological progress on population. So naturally, over this time period, when technology advanced, it generated an increase in income per capita. People use better seeds, better fertilizers, better tools. Naturally, they had higher a harvest than otherwise. But this was not long-lasting. This higher harvest permitted mortality to decline, fertility to increase, and as a result of it, the growth of population brought income per capita back to the previous equilibrium position. And consequently, technologically advanced societies or land-rich economies were not characterized by richer population, but more people. They had higher population density, but very similar level of income per capita. And the evidence is striking in this respect. If you look at the impact of land productivity or technology on, say, population density in the past, in the year 1500, we see this pronounced positive impact. But if you look at the impact of land productivity or technology on income per capita, there is no impact whatsoever. So this is the first building block. 
the, certain, the second building block on this, of these wheels of change that will ultimately bring about the transition from stagnation to growth is the impact of technology on human adaptation. So naturally, the Malthusian pressure affected the size of the population. But in addition, it affected the composition of the population. Naturally, traits that were more complementary to the technological environment generated higher income, tautologically, and in a Malthusian world, higher reproductive success. And consequently, they became more and more prevalent in society. And this adaptation process led to an increase in the prevalence of complementary traits to the growth process, reinforcing the process of development, and ultimately, the takeoff from stagnation to growth. And the third element that is important for the understanding of the wheels of change is the origins of technological progress. And actually, the size and the composition of the human population foster technological progress due to the supply of innovations, the demand for innovations, the diffusion of innovations, the division of labor, and the extent of trade. And consequently, these three forces operated jointly, and they can be defined as the wheels of change. During the Malthusian epoch, we see that the size of the population and the composition of the population triggers faster technological progress, but in turn, faster technological progress contributed to larger population size and greater adaptation of the human population. And this process operated over a 300,000 year period up to a point in which the technological landscape in which people operated changed so dramatically that individuals needed to invest in their education, in their human capital, to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. So responsible parents started to invest in the education of their children as a tool that will enable them to navigate this stormy technological environment. Human capital formation naturally triggered a fertility decline because families had limited resources and they had to prioritize quality over quantity. And consequently, the Malthusian equilibrium vanished entirely and the growth process was freed from the counterbalancing effect of population. And consequently, this holy triangle, if you wish, technological progress, human capital formation, and the decline in population growth trigger the transition to sustain economic growth. So if you think about the wheels of change, as I said, you should consider population size, the adaptation of the population, and technological progress. Throughout the course of human history, we see this rotation of these wheels, and this rotation becomes faster and faster and faster. For a long period of time, it doesn't make a difference because the environment is changing so slowly that there is no need to invest in the education of individuals so as to allow them to cope with this changing technological environment. But ultimately, after 300,000 year period, the technological landscape is changing so dramatically that the demand for human capital is increasing to a point where individuals start to invest in education. This is what we see in the 19th century in the context of mass investment in education, mass investment in, in, in public education. Now, at a certain point, this necessitates a decline in family size. This triggers the demographic transition, freeing the growth process from the counterbalancing effect of population and permitting the world to sail into the modern growth regime. So ultimately, at last, we reach a stage in which technological progress contributes to the material well-being of the population rather than the size of the population as existed over most of human existence. Now, it's important to understand the phase transition behind the scene. So when we think about the phase transition in nature, say, between liquid and gas, naturally this phase transition is associated with the temperature that is applied to the water molecules. 
And once we reach a critical phase, in fact, the water evaporates and we see the transition from water to gas. Similarly, in the course of human history, we see gradual change, gradual increase in technological progress that does not generate a phase transition. The return to human capital increases, but it doesn't make a difference. Up to a certain point where a tipping point is being reached and we see this dramatic phase transition from the agricultural stage of development to uh, the modern growth regime. But importantly, this phase transition in nature is not occurring at the same time point for all water, all water molecules. Some of them evaporate earlier than others, and as a result of it, there is a divergence between these molecules. The same is holding true for the world economy. Some societies are taking off, as I said, at the beginning of the 19th century, perhaps even earlier, other societies only very recently, and a huge divergence is taking place in the world economy. So when we think about the march of humanity, it appears that the march of humanity is perhaps unstoppable. If we think about shattering and dreadful events in the course of human history, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the Spanish flu, and recently COVID-19, it appears that this devastated humanity in the short run, but ultimately it had no impact on the grand arc of human development. Living standard in all these occasions swiftly recovered from all these tragedies and catastrophes. And now we are facing the Russian-Ukraine war that appears incredibly overwhelming, but again, the journey of humanity is providing us with a perspective, providing us with the understanding based on history that this is not going to be long lasting and in fact, it's very unlikely to derail humanity from its long run trajectory. Nevertheless, the looming question is, will climate change be very different? Will climate change derail humanity from its relentless march forward? And again, the journey of humanity is offering a very hopeful outlook. It suggests to us that technological acceleration in the course of human history is in fact the trigger of industrialization, is in fact the trigger of climate change. But at the same time, this technological acceleration brought about human capital formation and the power of innovation. And this is critical because as the world experienced recently in the course of COVID-19, this power of innovation allowed us to overcome a potential long-lasting pandemic with new technologies that were readily made in a very, very short period of time. So again, if we think about this technological acceleration, we see human capital formation, we see the power of innovations, and we see the persistent decline in fertility across the globe. Even India recently fell in terms of fertility below replacement level. And naturally, these forces could mitigate climate change because they can provide scientists with the needed time to develop these revolutionary technologies that can turn this climatic crisis into a fading memory, perhaps in the decades to come, or maybe in the century to come. So this brings us back into the mystery of inequality. So the book, in fact, as you will realize, is divided into two parts. The first part is marching from forward, from the beginning of, uh, of humanity, 300,000 years ago in, in Africa, to the modern growth regime. The second part is taking, in fact, a step back. It starts with the existing inequality and try to basically remove layers of influence so as to understand the root cause of inequality as we see it across the globe. So naturally, it's, it appears attractive to think about cross-country differences in education, in physical capital, in technological level, as the root cause of inequality across the globe. But naturally, this is very superficial. The question that emerges immediately, why some society fail to invest efficiently in physical and human capital? Why some societies fail to, to advance and to adopt new technologies? 
And naturally, this brings us to the understanding that there are certain barriers in the accumulation process, there are certain barriers in the technological process, and these barriers are critical for the understanding of inequality across the globe. So this takes us to the roots of inequality, institutional factors, cultural characteristics, and ultimately into what I will define the ultimate factors, geographical characteristics and societal characteristics. So as we peel gradually the layers of influence on inequality, the first layer that comes to mind are institutions, or the fingerprints of institutions. So naturally, we see the emergence of differential institutions across the globe. Some societies are adopting growth-enhancing inclusive institutions, other growth-retarding extractive institutions. But naturally, institutions are rarely manna from heaven. This adoption is not random. Yes, there are some critical junctures in human history in which we see the random adoption of institutions. This would be true in the division of the Korea Peninsula along the 30, uh, 38th parallel. This will be true in the context of the impact of the Black Death on the decline of feudalism in the UK, the emergence of property rights, and ultimately the emergence of industrialization in England rather than elsewhere. And this may be true in the context of the impact of the Glorious Revolution on the, on the emergence of constitutional monarchy and ultimately industrialization in England. So yes, of course, we can think about counterfactual history in which the division of Korea will be different, and in fact, the North would have been a Western heaven and the South would be a communist hell. Or we can think about an alternative outcome of the Glorious Revolution. We can think about the possibility that James II would have defeated Williams of Orange, in which case, in fact, we would see the persistence of absolute monarchy in England and perhaps even reversion into Catholicism. And this may have de delayed or perhaps uh, uh, moved the Industrial Revolution to another place in the world. But this is deceiving. It is deceiving because institutions mostly evolve gradually in the course of human uh, evolution. If we think about the Neolithic Revolution and the impact of the Neolithic Revolution on population density, the increase in population density naturally increased the demand for institutions that could generate cooperation in the construction of public goods and as a result of it foster the cohesiveness of society we can think about other geographical endowments, soil suitability for large plantations that could generate naturally the emergence of, uh, of uh, a landed aristocracy, a landed elite that is basically imposing extractive institutions and ultimately slavery. Or we can think about the disease environment as a factor that delays development and ultimately delay the adoption of centralized institutions. So overall, institutions naturally are important, but there are deeper factors that are governing, in most cases, these institutional developments. So then I remove the, the layer of institutions, and I'm looking at the next layer, namely what I will call the cultural factor. And yet again, we can see the emergence of differential cultural traits across regions. We see the emergence of growth-enhancing cultural traits, such as social capital in some regions of the world, and we see the emergence of growth-retarding cultural traits, such as family ties in other regions of the world. But again, this is not manna from heaven. In fact, institutions typically respond to economic incentives, and they respond to the environment in which people operate. Yes, again, there are some instances that can be defined as random growth-enhancing cultural mutations. For instance, in Judaism, mandatory literacy around the first uh, century AD that ultimately persisted due to the fact that literacy became very important in, in the urban environment. But initially, the sages that advanced this idea did not conceive and did not anticipate that this would be the outcome. So in this respect, it's truly random. Or you can think about the Protestant Reformation and the emphasis on thrift and entrepreneurship 
This is naturally not random. This is in the context of, of religious competition at the time, but perhaps semi-random uh, uh, cultural mutation. And naturally, this had an impact that, is, that was long-lasting. But broadly speaking, cultural traits are responding to economic incentives, are responding to the geographical habitat in which people operate. So if the return to human capital is higher, we see a gradual increase in the predisposition of human, human being to invest in human capital. If the return to agricultural investment is larger than otherwise, we see a gradual increase in the ability of individuals to delay gratification, and as a result of it, the emergence of future-oriented mindset. If the environment is very volatile in terms of climate, we see the emergence of certain attitude towards loss aversion that ultimately affects entrepreneurial spirit. And if the environment is characterized by soil that is suitable for the use of the plow, this generates a division of labor that is not very favorable towards women and consequently gender biases that again persist over time. So if anything, cultural traits are not manna from heaven, they are an outcome of the geographical and from time to time the institutional environment. So this takes us back to the next layer of influence, namely geography, what I will call the shadow of geography. Geographical characteristics such as soil quality, climate, the disease environment, and isolation. Naturally, they had direct impact, as you can imagine, on labor productivity, on human capital formation, on trade and technological progress. But in addition, they had an indirect impact on the evolution of cultural characteristics and institutional characteristics. So naturally, if we want to understand the world around us and inequality across the globe, we have to go to these deep, deeper roots of cultural and institutional characteristics. But this, in fact, in our march backward in human history to search for the deep roots of development takes us into the first revolution that humans experience, namely the Neolithic Revolution. And in the course of the Neolithic Revolution, the transition from hunter-gatherer tribes to agricultural communities, we see the emergence of a non-food producing class that is associated with knowledge creation in the form of science, technology, and written languages. And this transition is generating a technological head start that persists over a prolonged period of time. And some argue that variations in the timing of the Neolithic Revolution is the main source of inequality as we see it across the globe. So this is the diamond hypothesis. In fact, what the data shows us is something strikingly different. The diamond hypothesis is certainly valid and explains a significant portion of the variation still about the year 1500. But what Diamond failed to understand is that transition to agriculture was associated with the enhancement of comparative advantage in agriculture. And given the fact that technolo technology and, uh, is, advancing, is advancing more rapidly in the industrial sector as opposed to agricultural sector, in fact, this comparative advantage in agriculture in which there are limited spillovers generated over time a drawback to experiencing the Neolithic Revolution earlier. So till 1500, the Neolithic Revolution is important for the understanding of comparative development. After 1500, it dissipates an, almost entirely. And as we continue to peel the layers of influence, we are reverting ultimately back to where we are all originated from, namely back to Africa. And this leads us to the so-called out of Africa hypothesis of comparative development. Namely, that the migration of anatomically modern humans from Africa, 60 to 90,000 years ago, affected the distribution of population diversity across the globe and ultimately comparative economic development. So during this exodus of modern humans from Africa, departing populations carried only a subset of the diversity of their parental colonies. And consequently, over time, 
what we see is that indigenous populations that are residing at greater migratory distance from Africa tend to be less and less diverse. Now, this diversity is cultural, is phenotypic, is behavioral, and is linguistic. So all these characteristics are basically affected by this compression due to the migration out of Africa. This migration is sequential, and consequently, each departing population is carrying less and less of the diversity that existed initially. So if we look at the original population in Africa, and they have a certain level of diversity, then if this population departs and settles in the Fertile Crescent, some of the diversity will be lost during this process. Why is it so? This is sampling from a limited distribution. We have few individuals that are departing, small population to begin with. Statistical theory will tell us that the level of diversity will shrink in this process. Now, this population that settled the, 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 the Fertile Crescent is not residing permanently in the Fertile Crescent. Initially, they do. The carrying capacity of the environment is an order of magnitude larger than the size of the population. Population expands up to a point in which the environment cannot carry this population, and people continue to migrate. But as they migrate, they carry less and less of the diversity that they have. And consequently, when you look at the relationship between migratory distance from Africa in 10,000s of kilometers and diversity measured in different ways, the most diverse population that we see across the globe is in Africa, followed by the Middle Eastern population, European population, Asian population, and Native Americans. Now, why is it so important? It is so important because, as we know, diversity has conflicting effects on economic development. On the one hand, it has beneficial effects on creativity and innovations due to the cross-fertilization of ideas that are associated with diversity and complementarities in the production process. But on the other hand, it has an adverse effect on social cohesiveness. It reduces trust, it reduces agreements about the desirable public goods, and it triggers conflict. And consequently, if there are positive and diminishing effects of diversity on productivity, on, um, on innovations, and if there are positive and diminishing effects of homogeneity on social cohesiveness, this implies that one should expect to see a hump-shaped relationship between diversity and economic development. And this is precisely what the data is showing us, regardless of whether we look at it at the past or at the present. Namely, in panel A, you can see the relationship between diversity and population density in the year 1500. In panel B, the relationship between diversity and urbanization in 1500. In panel C, the relationship between diversity and income per capita today, and in panel C, the relationship between diversity and uh, uh, light night intensity today. And the pattern that emerges is that an intermediate level of diversity is conducive for development, but importantly, over the course of human history, as technologies are becoming more and more challenging, more diverse societies have the upper hand. So in the year 1500, the optimally diverse societies were Japan, Korea, and China. And in the year 2000, in fact, the hegemony is moving to a place like the United States. Now, this is not true only in, in the context of, uh, of countries. If you look at ethnic groups across the globe, 1,265 ethnic groups that are uh, recorded in the Ethnographic Atlas, you see the same pattern from 10,000 BC, 5,000 BC, 1,000 BC, to 1,500 CE. Namely, every observation that will be taken shows this pronounced hump-shaped relationship. So this suggests to us that, as I said before, the wheels of change, namely population size, the adaptation of the population and technological progress rotated in the course of human history, but not in the abstract. They interacted with institutions and cultural characteristics, and more profoundly, they interacted with the geographical environment and migratory distance from Africa. And as I said, in the course of human history, this transition led ultimately into a takeoff in some societies two decades 
two centuries earlier than otherwise, and a huge divergence in income per capita across the globe. So if you think about the roots of comparative development, it is apparent that two deep-rooted factors explains nearly 86% of the variations in income per capita across the globe today. The dispersal of anatomically modern human from Africa explains 17 to 26% of the variations. Time since human settlement and the Neolithic Revolution, around 3%, where the Neolithic Revolution is really minor here. Geographical factors, 27 to 38%. Disease ecology, 10 to 15%. Cultural factors, about 20%. And political institutions. 3 to 9 percent. Now, as you can see, all factors are important. Some may be more important than others, but in order to understand inequality in the world today, we have to be respective of all these forces. Now, as you can recall, a few hundred years ago, Malthus wrote his thesis and made very dismal predictions about the future of humanity. And economics, as a result of it, was termed the dismal science. So I'm going to contribute here to the notion of the dismal science, in the sense that am I suggesting, in fact, that there is historical dis determinism, and therefore we are doomed by historical conditions? And the answer is not at all. In fact, the insights from the genre of humanity suggest to us that the design of growth enhancing country-specific, history-specific policies is critical for the ability of humanity to flourish in the decades to come. Think about it in a very simple fashion. The World Bank is advancing the idea that we should promote education, and that's wonderful. We should certainly promote education, but the World Bank is not triggering the curriculum that is basically advanced in different societies. Think about what we just uh, understood about the role of diversity. Naturally, in societies that are highly diverse, education and the curriculum should be geared towards social cohesiveness and tolerance. But if you take the other extreme, a society that is very homogeneous, education should be geared towards pluralism, namely, towards thinking outside of the box, towards challenging the status quo. That's just one example that shows you why the understanding of the, of the path of humanity is so important for the design of policies that could mitigate inequality. Now think about the geographical origins of cultural traits. We talked about future-oriented mindset as an outcome of the natural return to agricultural investment. If there is a particular society that resided in the place in which the geography did not, was not conducive for the development of future-oriented mindset, again, the education curriculum should be such that there will be greater emphasis on developing long-term orientation among children. Musical instruments, for instance. Or if you think about gender equality or inequality, if certain societies resided in a region of the world in which plow suitability was such that it generated the adoption of the plow and the division of labor among men and women that is not very conducive for women's liberation, then again, in this society, more emphasis than otherwise should be placed on gender equality. And just to conclude, perhaps surprisingly, progressive policies that are not necessarily always growth enhancing, appears based on the journey of humanity to be conducive for development. Gender equality, tolerance, diversity, appears to hold the key for human prosperity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Oded, that was fantastic. Uh, let me now welcome our two other uh, panelists to the stage. Uh, Mark Blythe is the William Rhodes, uh, class of 57 professor of international economics and also, also the director of the Rhodes Center for International Economics and Finance. 
Uh, he's the author of many influential uh, books and articles. Uh, most recently, he's written a book called Angrynomics, which you can guess what it's about. Um, he gets angry at economics. That's actually not what he does, but he, uh, he, he uh, thinks about why stress is so high um, uh, in the modern era, uh, given that, as Odette has talked about, you know, uh, material well-being and health and uh, standards of living are, are higher than they were ever before. Uh, Glenn Lowry is the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences. Uh, Glenn has produced impressive work in so many areas uh, over the course of his career, um, probably uh, nowhere less important than helping us think about race and inequality. Um, and he's the recipient of many, many distinguished uh, fellowships and, and honors, including just today being named uh, a 2022 Bradley Prize winner, recognizing his extraordinary talent and dedication to American exceptionalism. Congratulations, Glenn. So we're going to have a conversation uh, on this panel for about uh, 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. At the time when uh, they call for that, we have uh, microphones in each of the aisles if you just want to line up and we'll alternate for questions. Thanks, guys. Gentlemen. Have at him, Mark. Gentlemen, how shall we proceed? All right, so um, I think we're going to just basically say something about what we thought of the book and have a chat, and then we'll just open up to Q&A from there. So I shall kick off on this one. I'm currently doing a class. Many of you are in my class. Well, it's not a big class, so, you know, proportionally, a few of you are here. And it's called From Growth to the Green Transition. It's a hard class to do because it's so bloody depressing. This is not a depressing book. This is a hopeful book, and we got a sense of why it was a hopeful book, both in terms of the fundamental mechanisms that Odette draws upon to explain the journey of humanity, and having the audacity to explain it as a positive story in this particular moment, I think is actually kind of brilliant. But then also to expound, as he did at the end, on, if you will, kind of the policy consequences of this, of how we can go forward with this and actually maintain this fabulous journey that we've been on. So I applaud the book. I recommend it highly to everyone. It's a great read. I think you should read it. I think you should give it to your angry uncle for Thanksgiving. I think you should give it to everyone who's feeling down and skeptical at the moment, because it really does perk you up nicely. Now. It would be remiss of me to sit here and not offer at least some kind of vaguely critical commentary, but I mean this in the best sense of scholarly engagement, and that's what I'll try and do in a few minutes now, just to put a few issues on the table. So the first one is when we were teaching growth in the class, it was very hard to find a book to start off with. So we went with this book from a few years ago by an economist at Harvard called Helpman. And basically the story in the book is the following. There were the classicals. They were kind of growth theorists. Then there was darkness. Then there was a guy called Dahmer. Then there was Lewis. Then there was Solo. Then there was Romer. That's kind of it. And it's a collection of special theories, right? It, none, it doesn't sum, right? If you think about it, with you know, Solo's residual becomes TFP, which is everything that we don't really understand until Romer says it's knowledge, right? So it's not joined up in the way that this theory is. And what we have here is a proper, I would say, general theory. Now, what do we mean by a general theory? A general theory explains all that these special theories can and can also make predictions forward and encompass more and more generally, right? That's a tall thing to ask for. And there is a fair question about the ability of social scientific theories legitimately to do this. And here's why. There's two reasons. I'll give you two examples. One is in the book, and the, the first one, of course, is Malthus. So Malthus, in a sense, was a perfect general theory that was 100% right until it was 100% wrong. So that bifurcation point, all those long-run factors you were talking about, weren't really visible. And when they became visible, we didn't even know they were making that bifurcation, that transformation, until you're actually living it. So it's very difficult to know how general a theory is. The second one is the only other economic theory I know that's dared to have a general theory title, of course, is Keynes general theory. And Keynes general theory was generally right for about 35 years. And then the world changed, and it stopped generally being right in many ways. So there is a question, I think a legitimate one, of how much we can expect this to go forward. It's a great and compelling, and I think very convincing story, of a very long period of human history, practically all of it to date. But can we be confident 
that that's going to continue. Right? And I want to be confident because I want to believe the story. I want to believe that we will continue on this journey together because it's a good one. So with that, a couple of just things to throw out, and then I'll pass over to Glenn. The first one, and this is on the whole core notion of human capital formation, and is it so central to what we are doing now and to, to the welfare outcomes that we care about? So let's think about this in terms of the fact that we're sitting in a university. We're not just sitting in any university, we're sitting in Brown, we're sitting in a very elite university. And we've seen a massive expansion of higher education across the West in the past 40 years. And particularly in the past 20 years, on the grounds that if you go to college, there's a college premium, you have higher lifetime income, etc. more and more people go to college. But there is kind of a simple demand and supply story here that if you basically give half the country a degree, the value of a degree has to fall. Unless you're at the very top, then it becomes kind of a gift in good, and then you pay even more because the returns at the top are even higher. So I wonder about those dynamics going forward. Can we put so much stress on human capital formation through education as being the thing that will allow us to continue this journey? As someone who's employed at Brown, I really hope so. But that's, you know, that's my selfish side. Um, the policy consequences on this. Policy can be good, policy can be really silly. Uh, one of, someone in my class the other day reminded us of the policy of the 1990s, which the World Bank was also behind, which was giving people in Africa laptops, which didn't go very well because they didn't yet have internet nor sort of stable electricity supplies or anything that would actually make the laptop into a serious weapon. It was gesturism in that sense. So you can take that as an example of, yes, you can focus on knowledge and you can focus on technology, but as you correctly point out, they have to be historically specific, culturally specific, and right. It's very hard to know in advance if these things that you're doing are the right things to do. Two more points and, and then I'll pass over. The book, I think, is wonderful on inequality between countries. You sat through the explanation. I'm not going to belabor it. I think it's right. I want to also acknowledge and applaud the fact that uh, what Oded does is to take on front and center issues of colonialism and imperialism and integrate that into his explanation. He doesn't shy away from it at all. Not as violence and conquest and extraction in the normal sense, but in a sense of basically taking the effects of international trade and amplifying them in such a way that those countries that were agricultural became more agricultural and more exploited on that basis, while the technological rents, if you will, all went to the ones that were already advanced. And I think that is right and a really useful way of thinking about it. But we do also have to acknowledge that we live in a world of great intra-country inequality. So there's been a cottage industry, as we, passed over, as we know over the past 15 years, of talking about inequality, particularly in the United States. There's almost more thesis of inequality and there's examples of inequality to a certain extent. And you can pick lots of different causal stories, whether it's Piketty, whether it's uh, skill bias, technical change. There's lots of different ways of, of getting it, and they're probably all grasping one part of the truth. But what then does human capital formation tell us about those inequalities? I think it's doing a great job on the country story, but what about inside countries in that way? And then finally, we have to mention climate. Are there no limits to this story? One of the things that we did in our class was we actually went back and read that notorious report from the 70s called The Limits to Growth. And I expected the students to hate it. And the strange thing is they didn't. There was still a resonance to the notion. And of course, we've become more sophisticated in this now with climate scientists talking about planetary boundaries rather than worrying about if chromium's going to run out. But nonetheless, there is this notion of there may be limits out there. And I just wonder about how the story copes with the notion of limits. So I applaud the book, but I'd love to hear a bit more on how we would navigate those particular challenges. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, Mark, uh, I won't take long because we should have some time for colloquy. First of all, let me just declare that we are in the presence of greatness. The audacity, the range, the profundity of this research program, there are half a dozen different tributaries that are coming together in a great river of intellectual innovation. Uh, my colleague Oded Galor stands with the greats of economic history in the ambition, if not entirely in the execution time, we'll have to tell about that. But we should pause for a moment and see what economic science taken seriously and applied assiduously can, can achieve. 
and I think we do see that reflected in this research program and codified in this text. Secondly, I'd have to join with Mark in asking, where is Marx? I see Malthus. Where is Marx? Where is capital? Where is asymmetric exchange? Where is power? Where is conflict? Where is expropriation, appropriation in this story of the journey of humanity, particularly as we talk about inequality in the contemporary world? And finally, because I intend to make my remarks brief, diversity, human diversity. He says linguistic, he says cultural. He doesn't say genetic. Why don't you say genetic? Isn't that the root of the other? Uh, isn't the uh, migration out of Africa as populations get further and further and as they become narrower and narrower in the range of genetic endowment that is being reproduced over generations, isn't that at the root of the other dimensions of diversity that you talk about? If so, what are the moral implications of a theory of inequality which at its root is based on human genetic diversity? If not, how do you differentiate between your program and the program, and I mean no disparagement of others who take human diversity seriously, we don't have to name names, and I am not make, uh, casting any aspersions, but I'm saying these arguments are extremely controversial. So where is Marx, if at, anywhere at all? And I don't, of course, don't just mean Marx, I mean Piketty. And of course, I don't just mean Piketty, I mean the people who are talking about asymmetric relations between the North and the South in the theory of international uh, global order. Um, so. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. You're very kind, both Mark and Glenn, that uh, really, uh, an honor to share the, the stage with you and to, to exchange some, some of the ideas uh, that are presented in, in the journey of humanity. So let me start uh, my response in the order of the, the issues that were, that were raised. And the first one was about the central role of human capital in economic development in the future and inequality within nations as opposed to inequality across nations. So naturally, the central force, if we think about the wheels of change, the central, central force that is operating behind the scene, and at the moment very much visibly so, is technological progress. And part of my argument was that over the course of human history, we see that technological progress uh, becomes faster and faster, and consequently, the technological landscape in which we operate is changing very rapidly and consequently requiring investment in human capital so as to allow individuals to cope and to navigate this stormy technological environment. I think that if anything, this will become more pronounced and this suggests that the nature of education in the coming century will shift even more dramatically towards general education and the decline in the importance of vocational education. So as we know in the past, much of the schooling was vocational schooling and was designed to prepare us to operate in a field in which occupations were well defined. But the environment is changing so rapidly and consequently occupations at the moment and in the future will change very rapidly and will suggest that the nature of education will be such that it will train us simply to learn how to think and to learn how to navigate this stormy technology. So my, my prediction about, uh, about, if I think about the next century in the context of education, as I said, is further decline in vocational education and further enhancement in uh, general education. Now, as to inequality uh, within nations, indeed, the book is focusing on the two mysteries that I underline, and they are really about inequality across nations. But naturally, one could have explored further inequality within societies. So again, if we think about the contemporary era and we think about inequality as we perceive it today, we know that a significant portion of, of the, the rise in inequality in the context of the past three, four decades had to do 
with what some defined as skill-biased technological change, but I would define as skill-biased technological acceleration. Namely, the fact that technology is accelerating, the fact that the environment is changing more and more rapidly implies that education is more rewarded, again, in the general form as opposed to the vocational form, and abilities are very important. And this is a huge source of inequality in the world. And again, perhaps this is an unpleasant prediction of, of, uh, of the journey of humanity. The prediction here will be is that because of this technological acceleration and because of the reliance on general education as opposed to specific education, we will see even further increase in inequality in the context of wage inequality. The third question that you asked was about the limit to economic growth. So how do we account for environmental constraint? And here I have to be a little more speculative and sort of to envision the course of technological progress in the coming century. And again, it is my conviction, a learned prediction, a conviction, but not necessarily empirically based prediction, that the nature of technology will be such that a lot of the limits to growth that we envision today will not be present in 50 years. So as I said earlier, I think that the power of innovation will take us to a place that we cannot really anticipate at the moment. At the moment we see resource constraint, I think many of these resource constraints will dissipate in the coming decades, and as a result of it, the limit to economic growth appears to me less, uh, less significant than uh, than we consider. Now to Glenn's uh, set of questions. So, yes, yeah, so where is Marx and where is uh, a sort of uh, political uh, uh, division, class struggle, etc.? In some sense, it's in the book, but it's in the book in, in, in a slightly more profound way, in my, my opinion. So when I def describe the writing of Marx, I'm emphasizing the fact that Marx, in fact, failed to see the importance of human capital in changing the, uh, the profitability of entrepreneurs. So when Marx was basically thinking about the imminent class struggle that will emerge, he suggested that we see the gradual accumulation of physical capital, and as a result of it, increased competition among, uh, among uh, uh, capital owners that will cause uh, the decline in profit rates, will increase exploitation, and ultimately will lead into class struggle. But as we know from human history, in fact, class struggle did not occur in most industrial societies. It occurred in Russia, which is mostly agrarian at the time. The industrial sector was, uh, was rather minimal. And I think that the failure of Marx, and I talk about it uh, in the book, was precisely the misunderstanding of the role of human capital in the production process. Namely, at a certain point, we reach a stage in which human capital started to complement physical capital in the production process. And in fact, it was precisely industrialists that realized this and lobby intensely for the provision of public education for the workers so as to prevent the decline in their profit rates. So Marx's absence in the thesis because he was wrong, in my opinion. He didn't really understand the role of human capital in the journey of humanity. He was really obsessed about class struggle precisely because of a misunderstanding of the importance of human capital in the production process. Now, as to exploitation, and, um, and the role, pardon? And slavery. And slavery. So in fact, I, I think that I devoted to this a, a significant portion of uh, the chapter in institutions, where I basically made a point that uh, yes, I mean at a certain point in human history, we see the emergence of what I call a new cultural trait. And this cultural trait is in fact racism. And in fact, this cultural traits is serving well certain individuals in societies, certain segments of societies, and permit them to be engaged in exploitation and to justify it by, uh, by pretending 
that other humans are not equal, and as a result of it, exploitation is in fact uh, uh, um, feasible. So certainly this is very important for the understanding of the journey of humanity, but again, I'm, the emphasis on the grand arc of, of human history is in the end showing us that this period of exploitation was not a blip in human history. Naturally, anyone who went through this period was devastated for generations and for centuries. But ultimately, I don't think that it diverted humanity from its course, and it will not divert humanity from its course in the long run. And now it's your turn to ask questions. There are two mics. Don't be shy. Or I'll call on you. That's what we do with professors. We'll start calling on you. While we're waiting, can I put another question to Odette? Please. Well, I, I just, in, with respect to limits to growth, with respect to environmental limits on the process of human uh, uh, acquisition of economic uh, well-being, if I heard you right, you're saying the track record for human ingenuity is pretty darn good and we can expect that it will continue to be pretty darn good and we shouldn't bet against figuring out how to deal with this problem without having to impoverish ourselves by artificially constraining economic activity uh, in a near apocalyptic panic about the end of the world is around the corner. Now, you didn't quite say that. I said that, but I hear you hinting in that direction. Would you expand? Yeah, so, so I think that you expressed, uh, I mean, you expressed my views better than I expressed them, and I think that these are precisely my views. I think that it is very difficult to anticipate uh, progress in the future. It is really something that we cannot fully comprehend, but based on the progress in the course of human history, we can anticipate that, in fact, progress will be made in this dimension and the limits of growth will be dissipating. Now, it reminds me that I forgot to address one important question that Glenn raised about diversity. It was not deliberate, uh, although it may appear so. Um, so, yes, so the migration out of Africa affected various dimensions of, uh, of diversity. It affected uh, genetic diversity, it affected phenotypic diversity, it affected cultural diversity, it affected behavioral diversity and linguistic diversity. And each of these comp component is operating behind the scene. I'm not necessarily belittling the role of one over another, but I think that, again, when we think about the conflicting effects of diversity, they're very general. The benefits of diversity in the context of cross-fertilization is valid whether it's behavioral diversity, phenotypic diversity, or cultural diversity. And the cost of diversity would be the same regardless of the nature of this diversity. So, so I think that I'm hearing the, the subtext in what you said, but I think that uh, I prefer to remain in this general realm of diversity and to define it in a very broad fashion if you wish to interpret it in, uh, in one fashion rather than another, that's legitimate, but I prefer not to be engaged in these interpretations, particularly not in the political climate in which we operate. Are we, are we gonna have to carry this? Come on. <laughs> Go, there's a microphone beside you, sir. Thank you, Professor Galor, for your time and your presentation, the rest of the panelists. Professor Galor, if you were named tomorrow an illustrated despot in charge of the USA, and you had one day, but anything you wanted could be done, which would be your first policy, based on what we've heard, to be implemented here in the US? Right, so I think that my first priority will be education policies, and education policies naturally have different dimensions. So I will, as I, I emphasize in my concluding uh, remarks, I would basically focus on the history of the particular society. So if we are referring 
to the history of the American society. I will look at the history of individuals in this, uh, in this uh, society. And I will ask myself, how can I supplement what nature did not endow people with? So if people lack the ability to be tolerant, I will emphasize tolerance. If people have the lack of ability to think outside of the box, then I will emphasize in the curriculum and I will teach children how to think out of the box. And if I would think that there is a problem in the context of the ability to delay gratification and to plan for the future, then again, I will take the, the relevant tools that will assure that these dimensions will be emphasized and will be fortified. So I will target education, but as I said, I will not simply say I would like to see six, eight, nine, 14 years of education. I will say I would like to see education, but I would like in addition to see the exact curriculum that is applicable to different sub-segments sub of the society and different segments of the world. Um, regarding the resource constraints on economic growth, even if technology makes it so we need fewer resources to produce what we currently produce, doesn't that mean we will use more of it, therefore we're not really limiting the use of resources? Can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear, understand. You couldn't hear? Right. Sorry. Could you say again? Um, even if technology makes it so we need less resources to produce a given output, if we need fewer resources, doesn't that mean we will use more of it or create greater output? Therefore, the resource constraint is still an issue. So there's an efficiency, there's an efficiency paradox. When you get more efficient and more productive, you don't go, well, we'll just stop here. We'll actually use more. So right. you still end up basically creating more of the same problem. Right. So, so thank you. That's a good question. And I think that, again, the, if we think about the lessons from history, that uh, over a 300,000-year period, we see technological acceleration. We move from uh, stone tool technologies to steam engine technology and to rocket space technology. So we move gradually. We are, nevertheless, I mean, we are naturally exploiting more and more of the resources, but in this process, we learn to a large extent how to produce uh, energies and sources of energies that were not usable in, this, in the past. Certainly, nuclear energy was not present uh, a decade, a, a century ago, and we can use it, and perhaps we are minimizing the use it for uh, inappropriate reasons. And we will find other sources of energy that we cannot simply envision. So as I said, my prediction, my conviction, and as I said, it's a learned conviction, but it's not empirically based, is that, in fact, we cannot really anticipate the course of technological innovations. And if we want to anticipate, the anticipation that we should have is, the, in fact, that uh, that we will be able to overcome what appears to be as resource constraints. That's my view. But again, that's a subjective view, not an empirically based one. Uh, hello. Uh, I just had a quick question. I was wondering if you could address the resolution to global inequality at the end of the, at the, end of the day. Because your own model suggests that um, one of the most important aspects that determines the success of a global economy right now is the timing of the, te uh, of the takeoff and the ability of it to adapt early to the new technologies. But technological progress is increasing in speed. So because of that, you would only expect that there would be you know, a few countries with very, very uh, successful and uh, blossoming economies and others who are entirely behind. Right, so, so as I said, I mean, yeah, indeed. So when you think about inequality today, it can be traced to differential emergence from stagnation to growth across the globe. And this, in turn, is associated with deep-rooted factors. But if you look at inequality today, as I said and as I just uh, uh, emphasized uh, in my earlier responses, we can design policies that will mitigate this inequality. For instance, education policy. Namely, I can learn from history 
about the difficulties that are prevalent in each society due to cultural traits, geographical traits, institutional traits, etc. And I can target these particular elements with education policy, for instance, and as a result of it, I will be in a very good position to mitigate much of the inequality. So for instance, if you look at the difference in income per capita between the US and Bolivia, Bolivia being in the sample the most homogeneous country in the world, the analysis suggests that Bolivia can increase its income per capita by about five, uh, increase it by about fivefold simply by having the level of diversity that is present at the moment in the United States. This is an achievable policy. This is a huge jump in income per capita. As I said, the book is focusing precisely on the roots of inequality so as to resolve this inequality rather than to suggest that, in fact, inequality is a fate. The argument is that if we understand our roots, we can participate in the design of our future. Hello. Um, my question sort of pertains to consumption and preferences in consumption in the modern growth regime. Um, my understanding is that in your model, there's some degree of a reliance on this idea of subsistence consumption. And once you get past a certain level of consumption, you start to invest more in human capital. I'm curious if you think that there's any play with like a changing view of what subsistence consumption is and as we develop and maybe there's a furtherment of uh, what we consider basic human standards of living um, and then also as consumption preferences might shift to just be consuming more if you think that that could uh, have an effect on the, the growth in the modern growth regime. Right, so that's an interesting question. So the subsistence consumption is not, uh, is not necessarily an absolute magnitude and it may change in the course of human history and it may differ across individuals. So there is significant amount of research about the fact that subsistence consumption differ across societies. For instance, in societies in which body size is significantly larger, it tends to be the case that subsistence consumption in, is higher, and as a result of it, the Malthusian equilibrium will appear different, and this may affect the timing of the takeoff across societies. There is nothing fundamental about uh, subsistence consumption that can change our viewpoint of the world, but we can certainly integrate into our thinking, and it is integrated in our thinking, the idea that subsistence consumption is a broad concept, it changes over time, it differs across society, it differs across individuals, but it would not really change any of the fundamental insights that we have. It would permit us perhaps to understand why in the context of Europe, we see an earlier takeoff in the north rather than in the south, namely that the subsistence consumption constraint in the north is higher, consequently income per capita in the Malthusian steady state is higher, and the north is in a better position to take off. But in terms of the journey of humanity, it will not really uh, change the way that we perceive the future. Thank you. Hey, I, I wanted to ask you about conflict. Um, so we're saying that diverse societies are benefiting exponential, like increasing growth, but we're also saying that they're being held by some external threats. So, uh, and like in addition, you know, technology is also pushed by conflict, right? So a lot of our technology is residual of, of um, you know, like armed developments and so on. So I wanted to ask you, um, in the context of, you know, Russia's invasion to Ukraine, uh, do you envision conflicts becoming more global in the sense that since, you know, like as a collective, we're developing a better sense of our identity as the West versus something else, uh, do you think that conflicts are just going to grow and keep growing? Yeah, that's, that's a complicated uh, question and it's really difficult to make this prediction. So, so your question had two parts. So the first one is that, in fact, diversity 
is contributing to social non-cohesiveness, mm -hmm. and as a result of it is uh, conducive to the incidence of conflict. And we do see it empirically. We see that, in fact, societies that tend to be more diverse uh, tend, to be, uh, tend to be engaged in civil conflicts more than otherwise. Now, the question is, what do we see across the globe? What is the tendency in terms of uh, um, migration and uh, the sort of changes in the diversity of the population? So as I said, if we think about societies that are very receptive to migration, on the one hand, they benefit from cross-fertilization of ideas, but on the other hand, we see diminishing social cohesiveness, trust, and an increased incidence of conflict. So certainly, um, if in fact you see certain societies in which uh, the degree of uh, diversity is magnified, and if there are no education policies that are designed to mitigate the adverse effect of uh, diversity on social uh, incohesiveness, then we, we may see this type of uh, occurrences. But again, we live in a world in which policymakers are very receptive to ideas, and I would expect policymakers to invest significantly more in the ideas of tolerance, uh, respect for uh, alternative groups, and consequently, I do not necessarily anticipate an increase in the incidence of conflict. Hi, so it strikes me that um, a lot of the changes in kind of education and human capital formation that you discuss in your book have been affected by cultural and social factors. And I'm curious about um, kind of expanding that to this education policy prescription um, since so much of the change hasn't necessarily been brought about by policy. Um, can we be confident that um, education policy can bring about these large scale changes, especially um, in comparison to fiscal or other um, policy areas? Right, so whether I can be confident, so naturally if I think about policies uh, in the late 90s, early two, 2000, what, what is defined as the Washington Consensus, and there was an attempt to basically develop a policy prescription that will, uh, that perhaps will alleviate uh, poverty and inequality across the globe. I think that the difficulty of these policies had to do with the fact that this was a one policy that was supposed to fit all countries, all nations, all societies, all ethnic groups. What we learned from the journey of humanity is that this is in fact uh, an ill-conceived ill policy. And it, if we want to design a policy that will be uh, successful, it really needs to be targeting a history-specific uh, uh, um, elements that exist in a society, and if this type of policies will be enacted, then again, I think it's a win-win situation, and therefore I do not see necessarily any difficulties in implementing these policies as opposed to alternative policies, because these are policies that, are, that will generate an enormous return, and, uh, and, uh, and in, in this respect, I do not necessarily see political conflict in the imp implementation of these policies. But as I said, the important ingredient here is to target the policies to the individual elements of the society rather than more broadly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's a great precursor to my question. If it's so, you know, logical and efficient to implement these policies, to have them tailored to each country given their history specific situation, why haven't we seen it already, and what is the path forward? Right, so because, partly because this is fresh research, and you know policy makers are typically adopting research that, uh, that was developed uh, decades before. It takes time for ideas to be diffused and to reach, uh, uh, to reach uh, the frontier. So if we think about inequality, I mean, research that was done in, about inequality and the impact of inequality on economic growth in the 90s initially did not have any impact on policymakers, but ultimately became the forefront page 
of the policies of the World Bank and the IMF. And I think that we will see down the road, it's just a matter of time, as I said, policymakers are slow in adopting uh, frontier technology and frontier knowledge. That's uh, my simple explanation. Hi, thanks a lot, very interesting. And I'm just, from the standpoint of uh, uh, upcoming generation of researchers, I'm just very curious, what would be your advice to the future, you know, generations of researchers, like how, we see this grand theory, right? So maybe the first part of my question would be that, like, um, is it the end of the story, or how should we formulate new questions, let's say, in the field of economic growth? And the second is maybe a simpler one, or I don't know, a harder question, like, what is your general advice to, to young researchers? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so, um, so I was asked a similar question uh, in a different forum not so long ago, and the way that I want to think about uh, the journey of humanity and my advice to young researchers is that, I mean, so when I was writing the book and when I was basically fortifying every little element in the book with the proper footnotes and the proper research, etc., I sort of, I was looking at some of the evidence and I saw that basically some humans devoted their entire career for the understanding of something that ultimately in the context of the journey of humanity is not even a blip. It's really a, a minor, minor footnote. And as I said at the time, I'm very appreciative to this because without these footnotes, one cannot really have the grand understanding of the evolution of humanity. But nevertheless, if I would have to advise my children, and if I would have to advise my, um, my students, I would advise people to work on meaningful questions, and questions that could make a difference, questions that will not be forgotten in 50 years entirely. And this is not simple. I mean, naturally, it requires uh, uh, different uh, sort of educational methodology. But nevertheless, I think the rewards are so large that this is what I would hope that people would aspire to achieve. piece of advice for young scholars, which is to go buy and read your book. <laughs> That's completely right. Please join me in thanking Oded and our panelists for a great discussion.